Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Judiciary Committee meeting. Um, we do we, we call the roll in just a moment. I will remind people that if you're going to sign up for these meetings, we need to do so if you can in advance. You can see how many people we have here. We have a fully packed agenda today, and so we're going to have to be pretty tight on timelines. Um, I'll explain the order we're going to go in in just a moment. But for now, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Representative Bolton. Present. Representative Bratcher. Here. Representative Cantrell. Here. Representative Decker. Here. Representative Elliott. Representative Fisher. Here. Representative Hebron. Present. Representative Cole Carney. Present in the room. Representative Lewis. Present. Representative Maddox. Here. Representative McCoy. Here. Representative Minter. Representative Mosier. Representative Nemus. Representative Petrie. Present. Representative Scott. Present. Representative Stevenson. Representative Banta. Here in the room. Chairman Mass. Here in the room. Well, good afternoon, everybody. We have four matters on the agenda today. We need to do a hard stop around 1.45 so the members can get over to session, which begins at 2. Uh, so we're going to take these bills a little bit out of order today. We're going to, uh, by the way, there's an overflow room in room 171 if we get more people in here and they need to have more space or spread out. Um, today, we're going to start with House Bill 488, which is um, brought by Representative Heverin. I'm going with the bills initially. This will be 488. The next one will be 501. Then we'll go with 214. And lastly, 313. I did them in the order of where I think the discussion is going to flow. So we're going to go with the quicker bills first. So with that, Representative Heverin, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for allowing us to be here today in front of the committee. Uh, I will introduce myself and I will let my um, colleague introduce himself. Uh, I am Samara Heverin. For the record, I'm Samara Heverin, 18th District State Representative. Jason Petrie, 16th House District. So what House Bill, 40, uh, House Bill 488 does is currently in statute, we've got a violation of an order of protection is a class A misdemeanor. What this does is make it makes the first violation uh, of the order of protection a class A misdemeanor. And then the second one, um, within a five year time period, a class D felony. And that's literally the bill. I will let my colleague speak if he has anything else to add. Representative Banta? Yes. Representative Blanton? Aye. Representative Brasher? Yes. Representative Cantrell? Yes. Representative Decker? Yes. Representative Elliott? Representative Fisher? Yes. Representative Hebron? Yes. Representative Cole Carney? Yes. Representative Lewis? Yes. Representative Maddox? Yes. Representative McCoy? Yes. Representative Minter? Representative Mosier? Representative Nemus. Representative Petrie. Yes. Representative Scott. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to explain my vote. Yes, please. Uh, I'm typically not in support of uh, additional felony, so I'm going to pass on this for now just so I can dig deeper into the bill, and if any additional questions arise, I'll come to you. Thank you. Representative Stevenson. Yes. Chairman Massey. Yes. Representative Nemus, would you like to record a vote? Yes, and I'm a yes. Thank you. Get the number. There being 15 yes votes, zero no votes, and one pass vote, this bill were reported with favorable expression that the same should pass. Thank you for this bill. For those in the room that are practicing attorneys that do domestic work, uh, this is a very uh, interesting area of the law, and it's brought about very frequently, so I think it's a, a good presentation, and thank you. Thank you, members of the committee. Thank you. Next, I'm going to turn the gavel over to my awesome co-chair, Representative Banta, and I'm going to step down to the podium and myself and Representative Hatton will present House Bill 501. Okay. 
Okay, please introduce yourself and proceed. I'm Ed Massey of the uh, 66th District in Boone County. And I'm Representative Angie Hatton from 94th District in Letcher County. All right, House Bill 501, and I believe there is a committee sub on this bill. Second. Well, what's the committee sub? Motion by Representative Fisher and second by uh, Representative Blanton. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Thank you. And I'll begin with the explanation of the sub quickly. Um, so there was a provision. This deals with the bill that was passed last year on child support where it had not been upgraded or redone in over 20 years. Uh, the judges were most appreciative of that, and that has gone into effect. However, we had a piece of that bill that dealt with calculation of overnight parenting time or credit time that had to be worked through. And so we put a deadline in that for March of this year. After trying to go through drafting procedures and learning it was a lot easier to talk about it than to draft it, we sat down with a national expert with the Child Support Commission with several judges and practicing attorneys that do this type of work and sought to find a way that we could make this work um, agreeably. So what we have come up with is the bill that is before you. Now, the important thing about this bill, because yesterday I started getting some emails from judges that were concerned, and let me address that. First and foremost, this would not go into effect until January of 2023. But more importantly than that, this requires the Child Support Commission to set out or create a manual that would be in use for judges, for practitioners, or for people that are representing themselves. We have that occasionally. When we sought out to do this, we wanted to make it the most simple, practical way to do this, yet be fair. And that's why we came up with the drafting situation that it was difficult to explain all of that out in a statutory concept. Because you have situations where you have people that have shared custody, and if it's a true 50-50 shared parenting issue, it's really not a complicated thing. But when you have shared parenting arrangements where people are doing different variations, where they might have two nights one week, four nights the next week, et cetera, then you have to find a way to compute an accurate accounting of that overnight visitation in order to apply equitable and fair credit. And that's what we sought to accomplish in the bill that's before you. Um, I spent several meetings along with my colleagues um, with the Child Support Commission, uh, I think they're presenting on another bill uh, today somewhere at this time, but um, at, at, we've worked with them diligently. They have agreed to work on this manual. We've told them we want that manual to be simplistic, not like the manual of Michigan, which is over 100 pages, uh, but we want to put in there examples, solutions, and ways to credit that time so that it's a fair calculation. So yes, we will have time for input from those judges to make sure that those matters are addressed appropriately in the manual. Furthermore, obviously with it being delayed until January of 2023, we will be able to make any adjustments that are necessary. When shared parenting, uh, a few years back, we had a case decision that said there's a presumption in Kentucky of shared parenting. It created uh, difficulties in the sense of, it became a more fair system in many ways, but at the same time, we don't want to create an avalanche of cases for courts where people said, I got one more overnight than I usually do, so I want to go back and have a hearing to change the child support amount. And so you get into these ongoing litigious battles between people in a domestic scenario. We don't want to create more matters. We want it to be simplistic, but there's really not a simplistic way to do this that is fair. So we actually, from the national expert, looked at models all around the country, Oregon, Arizona, Michigan, Indiana, um, look at our own model. And we created a hybrid that we believe, according to the Child Support Commission, is functional. The last thing I'll say is getting back to the question early on by Representative Stevenson about the change, it was a technical change that if there's a shared parenting, 50-50 shared parenting arrangement, then the person who makes the most income will be designated as the obligor. So that's the technical change to go into their computerized system because this is gonna be a situation where you can actually go into a computerized system like you can now, calculate the support, plug in the applicable number of overnights and get your credit. 
So it's a, it's a complex task. And, and fi- frankly, in our General Assembly, there are not a whole lot of attorneys that actually do child support calculations. Um, I'm very honored to have here with me today my colleague, Angie Hatton, um, Representative Hatton, that does that. And uh, we've talked with her about it. She's reviewed the bill. And I said, you know, look, we, this is a bill that is, it's not about partisanship. This bill entirely is about trying to create a fair process. So whether you're the obligor paying child support or whether you're the obligee that's going to be receiving child support, it is a fair, understandable format. And I'll turn it over to my colleague. Thank you, um, Representative Massey. And so I'm here to talk a little bit about the process of how this bill has evolved. This is my third year working on this bill. First started with former Judiciary Chairman Petrie and now um, last session um, in the interim and during regular session and in the interim again and uh, continuing into this session with Chairman Massey to try to solve problems that were created when um, we enacted the legislation that presumes 50-50 custody. And I voted for that legislation. I think it's the fairest way to do custody. But it created a nightmare in our antiquated child support system that, as um, Chairman Massey has, has said, had not been touched in over 20 years. We needed to update the income tables. We needed to determine what was going to happen if there was some form of shared custody that wasn't exactly 50-50 um, based on parents' work schedules and kids' Um, academic and athletic schedules, it sometimes is very difficult to make that custody exactly 50-50. And when it starts to vary, then child support was getting less and less fair for um, either parent and ultimately the child, because we want to make sure that the income level is about the same um, for the for the child, no matter which household that they're spending time in. So while it will continue to evolve, I'm sure, we have talked to stakeholders, um, judges. judges, child support enforcement officials, and then um, I'm a practicing family law attorney and, and need to calculate child support in my cases that are never cut and dried anymore regarding parenting time. There, the, the situation where there's exactly 50-50 custody and exactly the same income for both parents really don't exist. And I mean, it's possible if the parents have the exact same job and the exact same hours that, that they have the same um, exact amount of time spent with the child or children that it could be a zero child support situation, but for every single dollar or minute that that it goes up, it becomes increasingly unfair unless we make these adjustments. So while there is something to love and hate about every single um, state's approach to this, and there are um, things that will aggravate people or um, be difficult to learn and, and may ultimately need to be adjusted in every single approach that we took, we ultimately decided that this was the best we could we could do to address this problem, and we are certainly still open to to input from Move folks. Passage. Okay, I have a motion for passage from Representative Bratcher and a second from Representative Fisher. In any. As amended by the committee sub, do I have any questions? Okay, call roll. Representative Blanton? Aye. Representative Vanta? Yes. Representative Bratcher? Yes. Representative Cantrell? Yes. Representative Decker? Yes. Representative Elliott? Thank you. May I explain my vote very briefly? I'm going to vote yes. I have had numerous. Uh, contact from family court judges who have expressed uh, a lot of issues with this bill. Uh, I know you've been working on it a long time. I appreciate that. I know this is a tough area of law to delve into, and I will vote yes to move it along, but I think that some of those concerns um, at some point will obviously have to be heard. So thank you. Representative Fisher? Yes. Representative Pepperin? Yes. Can I quickly explain my vote? Uh, 
Thank you. I just want to say thank you all for bringing this. I think this is a very important issue. And I think a lot of times when we get into issues that are a little touchy, as Representative Elliott said, or he didn't say touchy, but you know what I'm saying. Um, it's something that's really important because what the thing with child support, I know we're looking at the parents, but what this affects is the children the most and the kids are worth it to figure this out. So thank you all for bringing this. I'm happy to support it. Representative Cole Carney. Briefly explain my vote. I'm going to pass on this bill today, and I appreciate all of the work that the sponsors have done. I understand the importance of the issue. I have a very specific um, piece of this bill that I'm going to talk to you both about um, that I think we can fix. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm passing right now, but I will be following up with you to fix that. Thank you. Representative Lewis? Yes. Representative Maddox? Yes. Representative McCoy? Yes. Representative Minter? Briefly explain my vote. Um, today it's going to be a yes to move it forward, but uh, as many of my colleagues have noted, I've heard from numerous family law practitioners and, uh, and one family court judge, and they have, some, they have some concerns about this, and I'm delighted to share those with you because they've just been brought to my attention in the last 24 hours, but I recognize the great work that you're doing to do something that is best for our children. So it's a, it's a yes for today, but I'll talk to you privately about this. I'd also like to register a yes vote on uh, House Bill 488, please, and, re and register my presence. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Mosier? Yes. Representative Nemes? Briefly explain, please. Yes. Thank you. Um, so I've, I've talked to a lot of family judges as well, and uh, my parents were divorced, and I'm concerned, and I want to make sure this, I think the committee sub handles that. I'm concerned that we make sure there's not more litigation, and most importantly, as a kid who was young when that was going on, I want to make sure the kids aren't brought to court being put in the middle of this. I don't want the kids to be able to be testifying. I was with mom. I was with dad. They don't need to be involved in this question. So I'm going to read it again. Talk with some family judges to make sure that we that uh, the committee sub does resolve those issues, which I think it does. Uh, so I'll be here yesterday. Thank you, Mr. Madam Chairman. Representative Petrie. Uh, may I explain my vote? Yes, sir. Um, I'm going to be a yes for today. I likewise have received contact from uh, some family court judges. I think some of the concerns that were expressed by other members are the same that I've heard. I appreciate the conversations with Chairman Massey about um, the issues as well as I think the committee sub may be addressing those things. So yes for today um, and, and I hope to continue the conversation with the Chairman and the, and the co-sponsor on the bill. Thank you. Representative Scott. Pass. Representative Stevenson. Yes, for today with a brief explanation. Go ahead. Uh, the ex I, I agree with my colleagues. There's some issues that need to be worked out. And the most important thing as a family law practitioner is the children. I'm, I'm concerned about the children. So, and they have no say. So thank you. Yes. Representative Massey. Yes. While they're calculating the votes, I will say we are encouraging judges to reach out to us. This has been filed for a, a while. Um, we've been working on it for a while. A lot of these questions came about in the last 24 hours from people that were not part of the process. The judges that were brought into the process who had those same concerns after hearing it said, wow, I understand it now, and they're okay with it. So we will certainly address those concerns. The standard is the best interest of the children always in domestic court. I will want to give a shout out to Lexington Sowers, the, the drafter on this bill. She has put countless hours in this and come into the office at points frazzled, but has continued to persist and um, has done a magnificent job with a very, very tough uh, situation. And so I just want to give a shout out to her, her hard work on this. She will continue to work on it. We welcome your input for changes because, again, that's why it doesn't go into effect until 2023. And as the manual is created, I'm sure that the Child Support Commission will want to hear from us about preparation of that manual. Okay. With 17 yes votes, zero no votes, and two pass votes, House Bill 501 amended by the committee substitute is passed and will be reported with favorable expression that the same should pass.
All right. Believe it or not, we are staying on track of time. Next, we will call House Bill 214. And uh, we have Representative uh, Johnson. And I believe he has some guests, including the Chief Justice who's here today and maybe another guest. And this is also one of those bills I will tell you as they're making their way to the table that there has been many, many hours put into this by the court, uh, by Representative Johnson, by many of us, including myself, Representative Petrie, Representative Nemus, and Representative Johnson, trying to sort this out, knowing the directives of what we're trying to deal with here as we have a state that is growing, populations are changing in various areas, and I do want the members to know that this is based upon a workload study for the judges that were done. So it's based on data that was generated. So with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to my colleague, Representative Johnson. You may proceed, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, DJ Johnson, 13th District State Representative, and I'm accompanied by a couple of other presenters, so I'd like to allow them to introduce themselves. Chief Justice? Uh, I'm Chief Justice uh, John Minton. Just Judge Lisa Hart Morgan, I'm the family court judge for Bourbon Scott and Woodford Counties. And all before we proceed, I will tell you that there is a committee sub on this bill, and it restores the 40th judicial district to its current county makeup and eliminates one district judge of division in the 40th district in 2027. And the original bill had moved Clinton County to another district, but the committee substitute leaves it where it is. Second. We have a motion by Representative Nemus and a second by Representative McCoy. All in favor signify by saying yes. Aye. 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 Yes. Opposed? There's none. The committee sub is adopted. Representative Johnson, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. House Bill 214 addresses several statewide judicial workload imbalances. And what I mean by an imbalance is either an unacceptably high or an unacceptably low caseload or workload as compared to a statistical norm for a judicial caseload. The workload values are a result of a judicial workload study conducted by the Administrative Office of the Courts beginning in 2015 and subsequently updated through 2020. If there are any questions concerning the, the history or the actual process of the workload study, I would defer to Chief Justice Minton to answer those detailed questions. Every circuit or district was evaluated and the results clearly identified the need for a comprehensive judicial reorganization plan. Such a plan needs to happen but also needs to be done in a meticulous manner, accounting for unique circumstances found in each district. Such a comprehensive plan will involve significant shifts in circuit and district boundaries, which will impact not just judges, but also circuit court clerks and, and prosecutors, circuit court clerks. Again, deferring to the Chief Justice to explain details, such a comprehensive plan should, and in fact must, be conducted in the coming years. In the meantime, there are several critical, jarring imbalances that must be addressed immediately. The imbalances remedied by House Bill 214 include work lo workload values as high as 2.24 and as low as 0.47, with 1.0 being the norm. While these and other statistics can paint a picture of the need for immediate action, I believe the committee will benefit by putting a face and a story to the statistics. That's why we've asked Judge Lisa Morgan, Family Court Judge of the 14th Circuit, to testify today. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I would allow, I would like to allow Chief, uh, Justice Judge Morgan to uh, give her testimony, answer any questions that there might be, but then I would like, if possible, to allow her to leave because, frankly, she's got to get back to work and get on, get on the bench. We certainly understand, and you may proceed. Thank you. I didn't know I was coming here for promotion today. So I have <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Maybe next year. <laughs> no, I'm where I need to be. Uh, first, I would like to thank the sponsors of this bill for bringing it before the committee, and if it passes to the, to the legislature as a whole, as well as to uh, Chief Justice for his hard work um, with a whole lot of folks on behalf of the judiciary um, to put Is together. Is microphone on? If not, can you pull it closer to you? Sure. We're just trying to make it sure looks on. on. That's so on. It, you just have to be closer to it. Thank you. Is that better? Um, I'd like to thank the Chief Justice for all of his work as well as um, so many people who have been a process of, of trying to not only collect all of this data but then um, to present it in a way and to certify the need as they have done again this year uh, for reallocate, reallocation of judicial uh, resources and for their invitation for me like, like yesterday um, to, to present again uh, to this committee to be uh, to represent at least those family court judges that would be um, served by this bill in, in the overwhelmed districts and mostly for the families that they serve. 
Uh, just very briefly, a little bit about me. Um, I took the bench in 2015, and I'm the only person on the docket for the for the job um, this fall. So, God willing, I will be the family court judge there through at least January of 2031. It's hard to wrap your head around that. Um, prior to that, I was a graduate of Madisonville North Hopkins High School, Murray State University, and the University of Kentucky um, College of Law. Long before that, I've always wanted to be an attorney. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and then um, decided my passion because my personal background was I wanted to do family law, even though that is not what most attorneys go out of um, law school wanting to do. But um, it is my absolute passion. Um, about 30 minutes ago or so, um, I was rushing to get through a, a pretty lengthy domestic violence docket to be charitied off um, here today, and then we'll be charity back to do a long afternoon. But I, I don't say all that to bore you or impress you. I say that because I feel like everything about what I'm passionate about and care about leads me to be in this chair here today. And I know that all of you have had your own journeys as well to have you be in the chairs that you are in and having just watched on the sidelines for the first time ever this whole political system i don't think that you all would be here if you did not or go through campaigns and all of that if you didn't really care and i watched last year uh, when this uh, a similar bill went through um, but unfortunately was not passed and so listen to watch more ket than i probably ever have and listen to a whole lot of debates but i really did watch a lot of bipartisan um, commitment and effort to improving the stability of families and protecting our most vulnerable citizens, including victims of abuse and uh, child victims of, of neglect and abuse. And we all know what, you know, how bad those numbers are in Kentucky. And I see all of this passion that goes into trying to craft laws and come up with multifaceted solutions um, across the board to strengthen family, uh, the foster care systems, to help with resources and, and with our, on the cabinet's end. Um, and I know that you all will hear a lot of bills today and a whole lot of bills throughout this session. But to me, this is not an exaggeration that when it comes to um, the family court umbrella, for those areas that are, we are overwhelmed and overloaded, I think this may be one of the single most important bills that you can pass that will make a significant effort to actually see an overall improvement. Because we put, no matter how good the law is, and I support so much of the, of the things that have already been enacted and the, and the efforts that have been made to improve the whole system, make sure things get through in a timely way, make sure people have full due process and access to you know, a, a court system and have courts rendering opinions that are based upon you know, really important considerations. But it doesn't matter how good those are, if we don't have the second piece to where we have time to implement them. I feel like it is, if you've given us a blueprint to design a perfect four bedroom, two story house, and then you give one person a hammer and a handful of nails and say, go build this in 30 days. It's not challenging, just challenging. It's not difficult. It is impossible. And so um, I think if you want to accomplish all of those overall goals, you cannot ignore the need to have um, judges to have enough time to be able to work with people and for people to have access to courts. Because I think that overall, the one thing that might make the broadest difference is have if people have timely access to court and meaningful access to court which means you have enough time to sit and really listen to people um, really be able to explain your rulings to make the best rulings that you can so that they can buy into those perhaps and it's not just a piece of paper that they walk out with that they feel heard it reflects better on the judiciary and they may be able to actually walk away with a roadmap to actually see improvements in each individual case and if we have issues that we know across the state where we have turnover with the cabinet, um, we have, I have great cabinet workers across my three counties, but they are well overwhelmed. And if I cannot bring cases back on for a review quickly enough or soon enough to be able to get everybody in the same room at the same time and say, what's going on? Who, who's the social worker now? And what can we do? And is this, getting, is this kid getting the right assessments, getting the right treatment? How are we moving you know, towards permanency? I would have an opportunity to try to address all of those, you know, overall concerns, and I think you'd see improvements overall. Um, I think one of the reasons I was brought here is just try to give kind of a, a practical sense of why that's so difficult in the cases in the places that are overloaded. My numbers, I think, were the second highest in terms of just caseload, but I also cover three dockets. And family court is something that is knows no boundaries. It does not matter if people are rich or poor or white or black or, or race religion, ethnicity, um, or political party. It, 
if it affects, yep. it's probably affected someone, everyone in this room to some extent or, or another. Um, and people need to be able to get quick resolutions to those things. So it, most people just think of divorces. It is divorce, custody, grandparent, grandparents' rights, establishment of paternity, establishment of child support, enforcement of child support, <clears throat> adoptions, one of the best parts of our job by far. Um, also domestic violence and interpersonal violence and dating violence. And one of the l largest areas is our dependency, neglect, and abuse dockets that probably takes up half of the time of the total of the eight or nine different types of proceedings that we have. It also includes any status cases. So those are children um, who are either runaways or beyond school or parental control or truancy. All of those different types of proceedings, if you're covering three different counties, also have statutorily mandated guidelines for when they have to be heard and brought into court. Um, domestic violence has to be at least within 14 days. If you remove a child, uh, if the cabinet removes a child, you have to have a hearing within 72 hours. You have to have the petition within 10, 10 days. You have to have the hearing and disposition within 45 days, and you have to have, in a termination parental rights case, supposed to have the hearing within 60 days. And on top of that, <clears throat> pretty much anything involving children has statutory mandates that it should be given priority. We have a motion on the bill by, by Representative Petrie and a second by Representative okay. Nemus um, to, uh, to be courteous and not to cut off the Chief Justice. Uh, we're going to let him, uh, if he would like to make a few comments and, and to briefly, I know he's put a, I don't know if he did the PowerPoint or somebody did the PowerPoint, but I know he's prepared to speak on it. So. Uh, we'll let you, and, and I appreciate the motion as well, because uh, the next issue is going to be a, a pretty uh, in, intense matter that needs to be discussed. But, Chief, if you would like to give an overview very quickly and give us a, a few words, then we'll move ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I, Mr. Chief Justice, before you start, if I might, can we dismiss Judge Morgan so she can go get on the bench? Uh, absolutely. I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> I've always wanted to say to a judge, you may be excused. <laughs> I'd, I do really ask that you would support this bill and so that we can be able to serve these families in the best way we can. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Safe travels. Thank you. Is your mic on, Chief? Just checking. I'll forego the motion. Uh, you, as you may have read my lips, I will uh, forego. <laughs> the uh, detailing on the uh, PowerPoint. In fact, I feel like I've made this uh, presentation before this very same group of people. Uh, I think this is take four. Um, so here's the point, here's the point. We have Judge Morgan, as she mentioned, uh, is in one of our overloaded family courts and she's second with a, uh, a workload of 1.67. She does the work of 1.67 judges as best she can in three counties. Uh, before that, the number one most, uh, most egregious in this Commonwealth is Knox and Laurel, where it is uh, the, the judge there, uh, Representative Lewis, is doing the work of 2.24 judges, 2.24 judges. How in the world? So the point is, very quickly, this is all about access to justice, all about access to justice. As Judge Morgan says, you know, we can build the very finest system of laws we can build, but if there's not the people there to get the work done, uh, you know, we're going to fail. So this has been a, a long road to get here and a great deal of work, Mr. Chairman, by you and other members of this committee working with us, and we are grateful for that. But, but the time has come to start the process. Some would say that the Commonwealth needs a comprehensive statewide. Well, this has been a statewide approach and it is comprehensive. It's limited in its beginning. There's much more work to be done, but the witching hour, if you will, is 2030 when all of the stars, well, I'm using, mixing several, several metaphors here, but all of the things will come together so that judges and prosecutors all come to run at the same time in 2030. So this is an important beginning that needs to happen now, Mr. Chairman, I can't, uh, urge enough and I'm happy to answer any questions I just want to be respectful of your time we, we do have a, a few questions representative Bratcher thank you DJ I know you've been working on this a long time I just you know we got the with the head of the judicial branch here we got the Judiciary Committee in the legislature why in the world can't this be fixed why every year we come back with this same issue I'm hearing issue I'm hearing stories of a judge tea time and 
on his on a golf course at one o'clock every day and then we hear stories of the judge previous what is holding this tell us mere mortals what's holding this up i think i will defer that that one to the chief justice <laughs> <laughs> well uh representative bratcher uh, uh we are we have been at this uh, i've been at this over 10 years you're right 10 years i've been talking about this uh and if i could get both houses of the legislature both chambers uh, on the same page and I'm, I'm i'm working on that i just have not been able to do that uh, I, you know i can get one side passed in the senate and it doesn't get hearing in the house and then i get the same thing happens the following year in the house and not the senate so this year uh, I just feel like Lucy in the football here, but I'm going to do my best, uh, Representative Bratcher, with your support to, to get this thing through the House and then through the Senate. Thank you. If I might add just very briefly, uh, this is a huge lift. I, a truly comprehensive plan is a huge lift. And I think what has uh, maybe deterred things in the past is that it's so huge that nobody wants to take that first step. This is that first step. This is, re, uh, is resolving critical issues, the most critical issues with our workloads across the Commonwealth. This actually impacts 18 different districts. It impacts 32 different counties, and it, it goes across the length and breadth of the Commonwealth. So if we're ever going to get a comprehensive deal done, we have to take that first step. This is that first step. Representative Cantrell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It, it looks like Jefferson County is losing a district court seat. Can we talk about the data behind that decision? Uh, yes, uh, Cantrell. The current uh, case load study, there are 16 district judges uh, in, uh, in Jefferson uh, with a workload, current workload of 0.93, with one being the norm. So less than one, and with the uh, re uh, reallocation of losing one district judgeship and reallocating that to some other place in the Commonwealth, the remaining workload is 0.99, which is still less than one. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Representative Nemus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would note, we've talked about this for a long time about going statewide but i practice across the commonwealth of kentucky and chief you've got some wonderful judges in your court of justice and our court of justice and it's not necessary in every area that we make changes we, if it ain't broke don't fix it is the kind of um kind of uh mantra that a lot of people live by and there's a lot of areas in, in the commonwealth of kentucky that work just fine and we don't need to address those areas so i think this is a statewide approach it goes as far west as as uh as um we, we got clinton Caldwell, uh, Lion Trig, and so we go all the way far west, and we go all the way to Floyd County in the east. Um, so I think this is looking at the, co the entire Commonwealth and putting the and, and making changes where they're most necessary. I would also say that the difficulty here in doing this, in re answer Representative Bratcher's question, is I don't want to lose a judge in Jefferson County. I went to law school with a lot of the judges in Jefferson County, but the numbers are clear that Jefferson County should lose a judge when you look at the overall scope of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. I don't like that. I don't like that Floyd County's losing a second judge in a, a number of few years or t six, seven years. But the numbers are clear that that's where the judges are most underworked. You know, those judges would disagree with that, but that's what the numbers say. And so it's very difficult because, you know, one thing we learned in the redistricting is when you take an unpopulated creek out of somebody's district, they freak out because they love that creek. They don't want it to leave. It's a similar thing in here. So this is a very difficult um, matter that we're dealing with, but I think it's um, extremely important. And, and even though my own county is losing a judge, um, and that's a difficult vote, I think it's the right thing to do. I would ask just a highlighting question, and that is the Constitution requires the Supreme Court, when we're talking about trial judges, district and circuit, cir circuit obviously includes family, that there be a certificate of necessity from the Supreme Court. It's my understanding that that certificate of necessity came from the court and that it was a unanimous request of the legislature for the changes that are in this bill. Is that correct, Mr. The Chief Justice? The changes that are they're all, with the exception of one, they're all uh, uh, part of the certification uh, by the Supreme Court. We, we've been through, you know, as you all have, we, we have studied the numbers, we've debated, we've discussed, 
and realize this is a hard these are hard votes to take but we've taken it and it, and the constitution requires us to take it first and we have thank you for that thank you mr chairman i'm going to make one comment and i'm going to turn over to representative petrie for the those that may not understand that are either in the audience or members that are on this panel that that may not be in the day-to-day -day operations understand that if you create a family court situation that's going to give relief to the circuit judge and to the district judge in those surrounding areas so we don't have the time to get into all of the numbers we've reviewed in preparation for today, but obviously that changes all of those workloads and the studies that we're talking about, and we have to make that align. So it's not just a matter of creating one court and then just disposing the other. It's because you're giving relief and changes in other areas that are beneficial because uh, if you understand the system and those of us that do that kind of work, understand that that circuit judges like for instance in, in Grant Carroll and Owen they have a domestic relations commissioner that does their domestic cases right now they don't have a family law judge so every recommendation from that domestic relations commissioner has to go to the circuit judge and if there's a disruption the hearing then goes in front of the circuit judge not a family judge because they don't have one so all of those adjustments have to be made on these numbers so you're not looking at it in a vacuum you're looking at it as these numbers are changing at a constant rate and the work that has been done to try to align them is all based upon data. And I just want to make sure everybody knew that. Representative Petrie. Thank you, Chairman. Um, very, very quickly, and, and Representative Nemus came across most points, and, and I'm going to encourage everyone to um, frame the issue this way. Uh, don't ask, am I gaining a judge or am I losing a judge? Am I gaining one in my area or losing one in my area? Uh, I, would, I would suggest that we all look at this from the standpoint of it's a workload study that's a public certification. It's based on data. We've asked for that. It's been given. It's been given more than once, and it's based on workload. Well, why am I talking about workload? Because all we should be considering, I think, is are our constituents being served effectively through the judicial system? And if you have judges that are being overworked, then they're not, those constituents therein are not being served. And if they're not served effectively, there's a really bad thing that pops out. Going to the court system, in a lot of senses, is voluntary. If it's effective, it becomes more voluntary, and you avail yourself of that system. If it becomes not ineffective and doesn't respond to you effectively, then in heated domestic situations and in heated other situations, people will go outside the court system to resolve disputes. Yeah. And that is not good on any level. Workload is a north star on this issue. And where we have judges that are underworked on the data, okay, that's ineffective use of taxpayer resources and it gives a bad rep to judges that may not be on the bench because they're underworked. So my judge, my district, my circuit, my family, I can consider those irrelevant. Look at the data, look at the workload, and think about services to constituents and whether those are effective and meaningful or just on paper. We have to make them meaningful. Uh, workload, I support the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right, seeing no further questions, we have a motion and a second on House Bill 214 as amended by House Committee Substitute. Um, with that, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Representative Vanta? Yes. Representative Blanton? Aye. Representative Brocher? Yes, and I'd like to explain my vote. We just had a judge before us that said people are being denied their day in court. And then we hear stories about, I, you know, I love my Jefferson County judges. I love every one of them. But we lost a state representative in redistricting. So if it comes down to losing a judge in Jefferson County or wherever in the Commonwealth, people being denied their day in court because of the backup is atrocious. So we need to work on this. I vote yes. Thank you. Representative Cantrell. Aye. Representative Decker. Yes. Representative Elliott. Aye. Representative Fisher. Yes. Representative Hebron. Yes, and quickly explain. And this will hopefully be the last vote I explain today. Um, <laughs> thank you for bringing this bill, DJ, uh, or Representative Johnson. Uh, while I do wish that we were looking at this as a whole of redistricting, uh, I am going to say yes today to move this bill forward, but I do hope that we can get the House and Senate together to work on redistricting as a whole, because I do think that's very important. Thank you. 
Representative Cole Carney? Yes. Representative Lewis? No. Representative Maddox? Yes. Representative McCoy? Can I explain, Mr. Chairman? Yes. I, I'm voting yes, and I just want to remind the chief that it was Attorney Massey that cut him off, not McCoy. So. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Mentor? Uh, I vote yes and briefly explain my vote. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm glad to move this forward. I'm very glad that Warren County's Eighth Circuit will get another portion of a circuit judgeship. That's a great thing. But my family court judges and attorneys would like me to lift up that they too need another judge, that they are backed up for months, and that equal justice under law also you know, would certainly necessitate them getting a new family court judge as well. But it's a great bill. I'm happy to move it forward. Representative Mosier? Yes. Representative Nemes? Yes. Representative Petrie? Yes. Representative Scott? Yes. Representative Stevenson? Yes. Chairman Massey? Yes. And while we're calculating the numbers, I do want to thank you, gentlemen. I know there's been a lot of hours. I know that uh, Chief, your assistant, uh, has put a lot of work into this. And I want to give a shout out to her. And um, uh, it's been, and it will, I, I confidently believe that when this goes through the process, there will probably be some changes. So stay tuned. Um, but this is an important matter. With that being said, we have 17 yes votes, one no vote, and one pass. So House Bill 214, as amended by House Committee Substitute, will pass with favorable expression that the same should pass. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the bill writer, the drafter of this bill as well. The lady sitting to your right, she has been awesome, um, and she has been very patient. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. She is the reason I exist, I believe. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. And with that, we'll proceed to the last bill we have on our agenda today, which is House Bill 313, um, Representatives Blanton and Nemus. Um, as you're coming to the table, um, I will tell um, the committee that there is a committee substitute in this. It's in your folder, and it was emailed to you last night. Do I have a motion on the committee sub? So moved. We have a motion by Representative Fisher. Is there a second? Second by Representative Mosier. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? There's none. With that, gentlemen, when you're ready, you may identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, John Blanton, represented from the 92nd District. Jason Nemus, represented from the 33rd District. Jefferson Odom, Shelby Counties. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, today we come to present before you today House Bill 313 uh, that deals with an issue that has arisen uh, within our Commonwealth over the last couple of years. Uh, dealing with bail projects that prior to uh, were basically non-existent. Um, we did take up uh, this issue during the interim in our Government Oversight Investigative Committee and saw that there was a need to look in further um, and address this issue through some statutorial changes and guidelines. Um, for those of you who are not aware of what they do, uh, there are organizations, some nonprofit, some for-profit organizations, and they go in and they post bail for individuals uh, within uh, the system uh, that may not have the means to be able to post their own bail. Um, and in and on the face of it, it uh, sounds um, like a very good thing. However, uh, this thing, this entire issue came to really highlight, be highlighted this past week in Jefferson County. Uh, as most of us know, we had a mayoral candidate that there was an attempted assassination attempt upon uh, his life. Uh, the individual was arrested and charged on a Monday and one of these uh, Bell Project groups uh, posted a $100,000 bail and bailed this individual out uh, on a Wednesday. Uh, basically, uh, what they did was circumvented judicial discretion of the judge to place a higher bond for the protection of the public. That's what the judge's discretion is for. And we've also found that in some circumstances, 
some of these individuals that have been bailed out uh, by some of these groups have went on uh, to commit not only further crimes, but be responsible for the deaths of individuals within the community, oftentimes uh, in the commission of another crime. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague and he can explain uh, what this bill will do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to start off by saying a fundamental. Representative Blanton and I believe in bail. We think bail is right for the overwhelming majority of our people. We support bail. We want people get to get back to their families and we want people to get back to their jobs. Bail is good. In, cra in crafting this bill, we have spoken with prosecutors, public defenders, judges, attorneys, citizens, victims. We've even spoken with the Bail Project a number of times. And I think it's uh, one of its founders uh, will be testifying today, and she is a very good lady who is trying to do the right thing, and we support much of her effort. Um, we support Bail. But with Bail, we have Bail because we have to have a protection of the public. You are not charged and then released all the time. That is not, uh, even though people say you're innocent until proven guilty, and you are, but, that, but our system, no system in the, in the United States, including the federal system, releases everyone as soon as they get booked. That does not comport with public protection. We did have this bill last summer. We filed this bill the second week of session. So last week's incident in Louisville highlights the need for it, as Representative Blanton said, but it is not the catalyst to bringing this bill. So what do we do? What, how do we determine the rules, what the rules ought to be when, you're having, when, you, when you set the rules for bail? We have to have human judgment into the equation. Human judgment, Representative Elliott, is so important because we know people. There are people in my life, there are people in your life, Representative Maddox, that you'd probably bail out. There's probably people in your life that you wouldn't bail out because you bring the human judgment, the knowledge of the individual. Will they be a danger to themselves? Will they be a danger to the community? Will they be a flight risk? That human judgment is not in the question when we're talking about a, co a corporation, an entity. It's not there. Our Commonwealth has recognized this and has been lauded throughout the country when we got rid of bail bondsmen in the 70s. And one of the main reasons we got rid of bail bondsmen is because it didn't have that human judgment that's tethered to the public safety, that's tethered to the knowledge of the flight risk and the danger of that individual. So we got rid of bail bondsmen. This is the next step in protecting our public. So what are we trying to do? We're not trying to outlaw these entities. We're trying to say that they can't bail people out for serious offenses. That's it. I encourage, we encourage, we want to in, we want to increase the number of, of uh, smaller criminals, uh, defendants, I should say, that are bailed out by individuals and entities. We're not, this bill doesn't cover that. And so we've said, and here's, now I'm getting into explaining the bill, we've said that no entity, has to be human being, no entity can bail out someone for a serious crime. Where do we put that li li line? We put it at $5,000. The reason we put it at $5,000 is because we reached out to circuit judges. We asked them to do a have a communication among themselves and get back to us on what they thought the, that line ought to be. And what they said was $5,000. They also had two other recommendations. They said under no circumstances should an entity be able to bail out someone that is charged with a domestic violence offense. Why? Representative Banta, because we know in domestic violence situations, there is an extra uh, concern and a timeliness concern of the volatility of the defendant. This is someone who intended to do what they were doing, they know the victim, they're angry perhaps at the victim, and they're more likely to finish the job, so to speak. So we've said domestic violence is out, an entity cannot release, release someone or post bail for someone with domestic violence. We've also said that, Representative Moser, on a bill that you worked on for a long time, if you're in on Casey's Law, because there's already been a determination that that person is a danger, especially to themselves, but also to the community, so no entity, no matter what the bail set at, can post someone out, can bail someone out for a domestic violence situation or Casey's Law. The entities cannot do it themselves, and they cannot do it through a third party. They cannot bail someone out through a third party. They also have annual reporting to the legislature and to the public, so the public can know who they're bailing out, who's, who their donors are, where their expenditures are going. If you're going to engage in this activity in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, it ought to be open to the public for inspection. Finally, and I think this is an interesting uh, addition, that I've, I've spoken with a number of uh, legislators 
uh, on this committee about, and it came from uh, your ideas, is that the bill that is posted by one of these entities, if someone that they bail out reoffends Representative Bradshaw, the money then is forfeited to the new victim. Does that make that victim whole? No, it does not. It does not make the family whole that we're about to talk about. But it's something, and it's especially something when there's a property crime, not when there's a tragedy that we're about to hear about. So um, if, if, if someone reoffends, the bond that's posted is forfeited to the new victim. Um, so that's, that's the bill in a nutshell. Mr. Chairman, if we might, I'd like to call on uh, Lois Winhorst and, and others, and I'm going to let her introduce them, uh, and they can tell their particular situation and, and to highlight the need for this bill, and then we'll come back to the table for any questions, if that's okay, Mr. Chairman. That is okay. Thank and you, we Mr. do have a number of people signed up, so we will proceed through that as much as time will allow. Hello, I'm going to be fast. My name is Lois Winhorst. Um, I have been working with victims since 1981. I'm the founder of Mothers Against Drunk Driving here in Kentucky. Um, there are two different bond projects, bail bond projects operating in Kentucky right now. One is the, uh, of course, the National Bail Project. We have a local chapter in Louisville. I think it operates in about 19 counties. They can answer that better. The other one is the Louisville Bail Fund. Um, I know that the gentleman, the representatives, just spoke about the max for bails at 5000 Because in Jefferson County, our Commonwealth attorney, Tom Wine, waives all cases to district court, he does not hear them. Our circuit court judges do not have the availability to set a bond. This is done at arraignment in district court. And I have to tell you, unfortunately, pretrial, they don't give them all the information. You're going to hear about a case, a man whose record started in 2012 in Ohio. It continued. He moved to, into Kentucky, three arrests. His third arrest. He was arrested on stealing a car, had a gun, and during the arrest, second degree assault on a police officer. It took three people to arrest this man. Um, he was bailed out. $5,000. The judge questioned. He looks like he's escalating. Yes, he is. They didn't have the NIC records available that towed about Ohio. Yet a reporter in our community with a phone call was able to get his convictions. He was a convicted felon. He, it was the same old story over and over, driving impaired. By the way, he wasn't charged with driving impaired on that arrest because he was outside of the car. He never, a lot of the cases did not show up to court. And yet, a bail, uh, what are they called, bail, uh, anyway, th no, the, the, the person that does the bail, they didn't have the records. I was also told that they will call a family member or talk to someone in the community. I asked if they did, to my knowledge, they couldn't give me the name of who they contacted to take this man. They recommended he go to treatment. He left the jail. He never showed up at treatment. He went right back doing the same things he did before he was arrested in February. March the 2nd, I get a call. 6.30 in the morning, my phone starts ringing. It's people calling me to tell me there had been a horrible crash on Dixie, which I was aware of. And when I see a horrible crash, I always pray that it's an accident. It's not a crash involving impaired driving. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I get a call from a reporter 
telling me that this person had been in custody, but the bail project had released him. I'm like, what? I thought they, I knew they worked with the protesters, things like that, that was my knowledge. Well, my research kicked in. I found out that the National Bail Project, I found the death of a woman in St. Louis after they posted the $5,000 bond. Her husband, who was her abuser, left the jail, she didn't know he was out, went straight to the house, beat her. Five days later, she died. Since September, in Indianapolis, two victims of domestic abuse have been killed by their offenders, which were released by the Bell Project. Mind you, Indiana still has Bell Bondsmen. I was shocked, I was dismayed, and more importantly, on Tuesday night when I found out about this, I attended a vigil at Butler High School in honor of this beautiful young lady. The other bail fund, the Community Bail Fund, Louisville Community Bail Fund, it is just totally inexcusable the things that they are doing in the Louisville community. I'm just gonna give you a few instances. In 2020, they bailed out more than 73 people in our community. They spent more than $2 million in Louisville bailing out dozens of people from Louisville's jails. Out of the 73 bailed out during a several week period ending August the 3rd of 2020, 37 of those people were charged with violent crimes, including rape, domestic violence, wanton endangerment, and murder. Some of you all during the interim heard the testimony from Mrs. Mack, whose brother, Terrence Sheckel, was shot in the back of the head. It's on video. A judge in circuit court, once she was indicted for murder, put a bail of 50,000. The Louisville Community Bail Fund bailed her out, $50,000 cash. There was another woman who was the victim of domestic violence. Her offender raped her, beat her to the point, lacerated liver, that she spent days in the hospital. They put up his bail, $25,000 cash. And then of course we have our candidate for mayor who is so lucky. A week ago Monday was shot at and within 48 hours his bail money had been put up. There has to be some processes and procedures. I don't want to see the bail projects eliminated but I want to see guidelines for our communities. What happens to the bail money? I mean, you can't find these records. The national arm of the bail project, they keep very good records. But where does that bail money go when somebody's followed the steps? Does it go back in to the fund for more bails? Or where does it go? These are things that needs to be looked at if we're going to have this operating in Kentucky. I'm asking you all today, I think $3,000 is a good spot, not 5,000, because the victims that were made March the 1st, the couple out in uh, Jefferson County that they were held with a gun and said, get out of here and took the truck. The truck that committed the crime later that evening on Dixie, and he still tried to get away. Stolen guns in the back of the truck, took four people there to hold him down to the police got there. Two new victims because somebody posted his bail money for $5,000, somebody that didn't have skin in the game, somebody that wasn't there to make sure he followed through. At this time, I appreciate you all listening, and I want to introduce to you three very, very important people in our community. 
This bill is called Madeline's bill. And her mother, Marcy, her father, Jeremy, and her brother, Peyton. Marcy, go ahead. Thank you for listening. Um, March 1st, 2021, a day that changed our family forever. It was on that day that our daughter, Madeline, a 17-year-old senior, varsity cheerleader at Butler Traditional High School was tragically taken from us. While the evening of March 1st, 2021 seemed like a blur and is still a horrible nightmare I cannot wake up from, the details are fresh and vivid in the memory as they were on that night. Madeline had just finished her varsity cheerleading practice at Butler and was taking her brother, my son, Peyton, to work from baseball practice as he is a student at Butler as well. After she dropped Peyton off at Chick-fil-A for his part-time shift, Madeline began her usual route home from practice on Dixie Highway. It was not five minutes later after her brother was dropped off that my daughter would be hit head on by a wrong way speeding stolen truck. The driver of that truck refused to render aid and tried to flee the scene, but was wrestled down by several individuals who just so happened to be walking in the area at the time. Soon after we found out that the truck had been stolen and that this man was under the influence of alcohol and several substances, this man and his ridiculous decisions took everything for me and my family. Madeline was a daughter, our daughter, a sister to two brothers that she adored, a granddaughter, a niece, a cousin, a girlfriend, and a friend to so many. Words to describe Madeline include happy, loving, and kind. She had a very bright future ahead of her and was so excited for the next season of life. Madeline enjoyed helping people and being a helping hand to anyone that needed it. My girl kept a very busy academic and extracurricular schedule and also found time to build a community with some local South End friends at our local Chick-fil-A. She had plans to attend Bellarmine University in the fall of 2021. And as a high school senior, Madeline was already working with an internship at Norton Women's and Children's Hospital. There's no doubt that her calling in life was helping others in their time of hurt and crisis. Madeline's smile always lit up in whatever room that she was in. A year after her passing, I am reminded of just how much joy and happiness that smile and positive energy brought to those she knew and loved. Whether it was the most important individual in the room or the individual that very few talked to, my Madeline was a friend to all. One week away from the one year anniversary of my daughter's passing, Madeline is the light in our lives. And while there are many days in which I feel like throwing my hands up, she is the bright light that lights the path in such a dark and bitter world. Nonetheless, I am here in this dark and bitter world with a mission and a purpose. I am here today to fight on behalf of Madeline, for the hearts of my family, and for families across the state of Kentucky. You see, this tragedy could have been avoided. The driver of the stolen truck, whose name does not deserve to be said aloud, was arrested on February 27th less than 48 hours before this wreck for stealing a vehicle and several different drugs. Nonetheless, this criminal and liability to society was re released as he was bailed out by the Louisville Bell Project with no money out of his own pocket and no accountability. This man has a file that was multiple pages long. No background information or check was placed on this man, nor were the programs set up or enforced to ensure that he would not go back out and repeat his decisions which he did. The reason that my daughter is not here is at the hands of the Louisville Bell Project and its supporters. The reason that my husband will not have his daughter to walk down the aisle is at the hands of the Louisville Bell Project and its supporters. The reason of the constant struggle and heartache of my two boys when they think about their sister is at the hands of the Louisville Bell Project and its supporters. The reason my long days, the reason for my long days where it is all I can do to move and sleepless nights is at the hands of the Louisville Bell Project. At the end of the day, it is not the Louisville Bell Project whose lives are drastically changed and altered because of the decisions of a criminal. It is ordinary families such as mine.
While bail groups pay for those who have done a crime, it is people like myself that will have to pay for a lifetime. My family and I are here today in support of House Bill 313 in hopes of stopping organizations like these from releasing criminals back into the public with no supervision or accountability. Our family, this community, and our state will forever be denied all of the good that Madeline would have brought. She, she was a good girl. She had so many dreams to look forward to and I just she was taken because someone that shouldn't have been out on the road was out on the road that night and it's just not fair so I thank you for, for hearing us out today and this is Peyton Madeline's brother Madeline Trout is my sister it was my best friend she was the person I could talk to when I needed someone and was there to set me straight, even when I didn't necessarily ask for it. She was the light in my world. I could never have imagined a life without her. And yet, here I am, learning to live with life without her. My big sister and her beautiful life was taken from me and my family due to a local bell group and let's call the man for what he is, a felon and a criminal, who was let out of jail literally for free. The evening of March 1st was an event that will forever impact my life. Now all I have are memories. I would never forget the times so she would make me laugh when I needed it. The late night car rides when we talked about our day. The times when we would work together at Chick-fil-A. But I will now have to live the rest of my life knowing that those memories are all I have as she is not with the, no longer here. On March 1st, 2021, this day changed mine and my family's life drastically. The decision of the Bell Project, letting a felon out of custody with no supervision, has changed the phrase, normal life, in my life. My family and I will never be the same after the passing of my sister. My family, the community we live in, and our state will never get to see the love and the light I knew her to be. And that will forever be our loss as a family, community, and state. Thank you. Just thank you for hearing it out. All right. We do have um, several folks that have signed up uh, to speak, and we'll monitor that carefully. We do have some time. Uh, first on our sign-in sheet, we have Carrie Cole from the Bail Project. Just make sure that your your green light is on. We're trying to remind people of that. So, Good morning, Chairman Massey and members of the committee. My name is Carrie Cole, and I'm the operations manager of the Louisville site of the Bail Project. I grew up in Louisville and work here. I'm a social worker by training, and I deeply understand the social challenges that your constituents face. I was one of the first employees for our Louisville site, and our current team in Louisville are your constituents, living and engaging with their respective Kentucky communities. We are just as invested in you are in making sure that Kentucky is a safe place where all of its residents can thrive. The Bail Project is a national nonprofit with the mission to end cash bail. Since 2018, we have provided free bail assistance to nearly 4,000 Kentuckians in 28 counties statewide. In addition to posting bail, we provide court reminders, travel assistance, and connections to social services like temporary housing, employment assistance, and behavioral health services. Our clients have returned to over 90% of their court dates. The Bail Project is a sunset organization, and our goal is to put ourselves out of business. We want to end the use of cash bail so that our revolving bail fund is not necessary in Kentucky. We are opposed to House Bill 313 because it would, limber, it would limit the number of poor Kentuckians charitable bail organizations can serve by restricting the amount of bail to 5,000 or less, which means that a poor person presumed innocent for a low-level misdemeanor, for example, will remain in jail if their bail is set above that amount. Meanwhile, wealthy people charged with more serious offenses and high bail amounts will be able to buy their freedom. This does not protect public safety. Additionally, House Bill 313 will prohibit charitable bail organizations from posting bail from anyone charged with domestic or dating violence or anyone under civil court order for involuntary treatment for substance use disorder. 
Not only does this prohibition undercut the fundamental right to be presumed innocent, regardless of the charge, but once a judge determines what, the, what price it must be to be paid for a person to be released from jail, it doesn't matter who posts the bond, a relative, church, or a community bail fund. Our U.S. currency is the same as a grandmother's. Further destroying the presumption of innocence is the shocking requirement that charitable bail organizations forfeit bail money to an alleged victim if an accused person out on bond is accused of the commission of a new crime. An accusation or an arrest does not equal a conviction. Finally, House Bill 313 sets a reporting requirement for ch a charitable bail organization that it, does all, that it does not also impose on other individuals and groups who post bail. House Bill 313 also requires charitable bail organizations to share information about its donors, which is unfair and illegal, as determined by the U.S. Supreme Court and Americans for Prosperity v. Bonta in 2020. 501c3 organizations are already, already regulated by the state and federal government. This provision is against the spirit of charitable giving and can inadvertently disincentivize would-be donors from providing funding to this critical cause or any other important cause, as this bill would open the door to an unprecedented practice. This bill does not ensure public safety by limiting our services. In fact, it does the opposite by ensuring more Kentuckians will be subject to the harms that come from remaining in jail before their trial. It also ensures that taxpayers will continue to foot the bill to maintain Kentucky's overcrowded jails. We are all aware of the increased urgency that lawmakers are feeling to address elevated crime levels. We feel that urgency too, but we must be careful not to legislate from the fringes. The stories that have been in the news, the ones that target, that target charitable bail organizations, overemphasize tragedy and fo focus on rare tragic cases. This does not mean that these events when they occur are no less heartbreaking, but they are rare. The urgency of our concerns must be focused on the elimination of cash bail and the reform of the pretrial system altogether, something the Bail Project is experienced in, as we have been developing a model of robust pretrial services and supports that can be adopted across this country. The Bail Project's intervention is designed to enhance the public safety of the communities in which we operate, not undermine it. And we are doing that. We have the experience and we have the evidence. We know what works and we urge you to work with us instead of against us to fix this problem. Do not eliminate or restrict our ability to operate. Partner with us. I want to thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Seeing no questions um, of this uh, witness, we will have uh, Shamika. Is it Shamika? <laughs> and I, I'm not going to try to stab your last name. What's your last name? Parish right. Okay. Are you ready, ma'am? Yes. You may come up and proceed. Be brief, please. As brief as you can. People always tell me that for some reason, huh? I get the same thing, so it's good. I wrote a statement because of that. Um, thank you. Good afternoon. I want to thank you, Chairman Massey, and all of the members um, of the committee. My name is Shamika Parish Wright, and I am testifying before you today um, for my personal capacity. I have lived and worked in Kentucky for more than 20 years. I am a constituent. I am a Louisville resident. This is my home. This issue of bail is close to my heart because I have suffered from it personally. When I was 18 years old, I was getting ready to start college. I got engaged and I had a young daughter. One night, things went all wrong. My ex fiance fought me, put his hands on me while I was trying to clean. I thought that I was going to lose my life. I fought back. He did not like this. He smacked the drink out of my hand and just kept yelling at me. And so this argument turned into a physical fight that I never expected. I began to move around and try to escape and I couldn't. I tried to defend myself the best way I could. Someone, one of our neighbors called the police. <coughs> when the police came, I told them everything that had happened. I had never been arrested. I did not realize that I was signing my own warrant as I wrote down to what happened. I was handcuffed and taken to jail. I spent two days in jail before ever seeing a judge. Little did I know my ordeal was just starting. My ex fiance, on the other hand, was charged with domestic violence. He was able to quickly secure his release. He never spent the night in jail. I didn't have those kind of resources. Even when he came to court to defend me and explain that he had started the altercation, the judge did not care 
and set my bail at $10,000. I didn't have the money, neither did any of my loved ones. I was charged with a felony and was told that I was facing prison if I went to trial and lost. I didn't know what to do. I had a younger daughter at home and my college education ahead of me. I saw my life falling apart before my eyes. Like so many do in that situation, I weighed my options. Do I plead guilty for a lesser mm -hmm. offense and go home to my daughter and start college on time? Or do I hold on to my innocence and sit in jail until I have a trial? After spending 38 days in jail, I pled guilty to a lesser charge. All I wanted was to get out and see my daughter. I wanted to be home. I knew this plea would give me a criminal record that will follow me for the rest of my life. But at that moment, I felt I had no other choice. And that's the choice countless people make countless people make in Kentucky every single day because of that of the cash bail system. If I had money to pay my bail or if there was a charitable bail organization available to support me, I could have gone home, worked with a lawyer to fight my case. I could have avoided conviction. I would not have had a criminal record, but because I was poor, I did not get my due process. The presumption of innocence only existed on paper. It's been 25 years since that night when I thought my young life would come to a premature end. House Bill 313 is not the solution. In fact, it's a distraction from the very real issues we face in our state, the impact on public safety, issues of drug addiction ravaging our communities, mental illness, poverty, homelessness, and the list goes on. Doubling down on the cash bail system by targeting charitable bail organizations is a misguided attempt to respond to political pressure that will increase your jail costs as a result and kicking the can down the road instead of taking on these public health crises head on. You, one of your colleagues last year, was indicted on alleged charges of strangulating his wife, received a $25,000 bail, and was out within an hour. Right now, as we meet here, Officer Hankinson, former Officer Hankinson, is on trial for shooting through the neighbor's walls of Breonna Taylor, $15,000 bond, and was out within an hour. Eliminating cash bail should not be an issue of blue or red, Democrat or Republican. It's an issue of what's wrong and what's right. And putting a price tag on a presumption of innocence is simply wrong. Restricting charitable bail organizations is irrational. It is the equivalent of limiting food banks when the real poverty problem is poverty and hunger. I respectfully ask you not to react to recent media reports with a heavy hand and instead take a thoughtful approach to our shared concerns. The vast majority of people out on bail go to work, school, return home to their families without incident. Their success stories like mine do not make it on the news. I was lucky, lucky in my life. Many people would not have that same experience. Incarceration is traumatizing. It forces people to make decisions they would not otherwise make to protect their physical bodies and their minds. To protect their families, if you enact this legislation, you would separate single mothers from their children. You would drive those separated in children into trauma and foster care. You'll force employment instability and housing insecurity. You'll increase the likelihood that people will not be able to escape the grip of a criminal legal system involvement. Academic research bears all of this out. And I know from my own experience and my experience speaking with hundreds of directly impacted people that this is true. Don't pass this bill. Instead, I encourage the committee to take the time to collect and analyze the data to learn more about our criminal legal system. It's clear that people don't understand what a revolving bail fund is. It's clear that people don't understand how bail works. It clears, it's clear that people don't understand that there's pretrial incarceration and then there's bail that is a, a condition of release. You know, we need really complete information that deals with the complete fiscal and racial impact statements before passing legislation that will not effectively solve the complex issues facing our, our communities. Vote no on House Bill 313. Thank you. And as a mother of six and a grandmother of three, I am sorry that that happened. I didn't, I've never met you. I don't live far from Butler. My daughter worked at Chick-fil-A too. This hits me home. But if it was even in my children, I would be standing here, standing on our work. I'm glad that there's some form of justice happening as Mr. DeWitt is on facing trial, but do know that I don't take this lightly. And Lois, we've talked about that. Thank you.
All right, we have two more people signed up, and I'm going to get you out of here by 145. So we're going to continue to proceed. Since we've already heard from one person from the Bail Project, I'll call them last. I'm going to hear from Shamel Helm. Chanel Helm. Chanel Helm. Sorry, I'm reading off the best I can. Um, and please come forward, ma'am, and identify yourself, and you may proceed. Thank you so much. Before I even get started, I do want to say that even though we didn't vote or not, it has nothing to do with that. Nobody should ever leave somebody in their family. You're absolutely correct. But you will understand what the Louisville Community Bail Fund does, um, and that's what I want to lead with. We were never contacted about this bill, nor our work from anyone who has put this bill together. So is it? Yes, it's green. Look closer. It moves. This. Oh, okay. It was kind of heavy. Thank you so much. Um, so I am a bit um, confused as to why there is an over resounding notion that those things did happen. Um, community bail funds have been around for decades. Um, they did not just erupt all of a sudden. And there are not just two types of bail funds that are in Kentucky operating right now. There are three others that also take care of specific crimes and how they happen. Community bail funds do not only bail people out, we also bail out the community. So there are very much injustices that we talk about that not only deal with the criminal justice system, they also deal with why people create crime in the first place. And as a West End Louisville resident, um, a historic West End Louisville resident, I can still state to you that there are other things that we have bailed out in our community besides people. I just wanna name those things because nobody has asked us about those and you are assuming too much. We have created a grocery store because we live in a food apartheid where fresh foods are not available to over 60,000 people in the West End of Louisville. We bought an abandoned church so that we could create what the community asked for and they've created and wanted an art gallery, a kitchen that works. We feed over 2,500 people a week and we make sure children have a safe place to come study. We've also bought an emergency housing house because people do not have housing in a housing crisis in the West End of Louisville of blighted neighborhoods and we house them. We don't send them through red tape, we house them. So yes, I do agree that this bill is ill purpose because the information in the bill is already public. There's no need to report to you all because the reporting is already done when you bail somebody out. The courts have a list of people who bail people out regardless if they are us or they are somebody who isn't us. And that is made to you upon request, and you can do that. What the Community Bail Fund does, though, is build support systems for those folks who are not able to have support. There are people who have way harsher crimes, and those folks need things. Some folks involve drugs, some folks involve violence, and if we are able to create that support plan with them, with licensed professional social workers, with licensed professional therapists, with licensed professional lawyers, who we detail their crime with, which we do, we build that out. If we can't do that, then we don't bail them out. All of that could have been asked, and it could have been ready and prepared for before we got here. Um, and to speak about the crime last week that took place, there are rumors that are going around about who Quintez Brown is, but we don't need to question who he is because he wrote who he is and why he exists and what is happening to him. That changed last week. An entire community, a group of people who love him very much dearly, are really wondering what is happening and we're there because we're wondering what's going on. The conditions for his bail were set by a judge, not the Community Bail Fund, not the Bail Project, not the Freedom Project, not the Immigrant Bail Fund. They were set by a judge and they are being completed by that judge. If there is an issue with bail, then you take it up with the judge, but I'm also concerned. I'm also concerned at how murderers can have lower bail than people who have drug offenses or people who are not violent. That's the question at hand right now. How is somebody who has already committed several crimes have $5,000 bail over somebody who's not committed any type of crime whatsoever? And why isn't the courts issuing the support that is being requested by the legal defense? I'm not saying that this always correctly, but we work too hard to do that. What has happened to us since 2020 is tons, tons of assaults on the people who work here, data analysts, social workers, community organizers, we are mothers, we are residents, we have been stalked, we have been chastised, we have been 
I mean, like this is almost sabotage in itself. Nobody has contacted us at all. And I don't think that's fair to say and put that on record. And I'm down to speak to anybody who would like to and work on an actual bill that talks about the things that you were trying to address. I do want to read something else before I leave, because there's another issue at hand that we're talking about. And too many folks are not making enough noise about what is happening in Louisville Metro Department of Corrections right now. On November 29, 2021, Kenneth Hall was found unresponsive. On December 3, 2021, Rakita Smith was found unresponsive. On December 4, 2021, Stephanie Dunbar, another woman, was found by suicide. On January 2nd, 2022, Gary Withall was found by suicide. On January 9th, 2022, Keith Smith was found unresponsive on the medical floor. And February 6th, a week before Quintess Brown committed his crime, Leslie Starnes was found by hung by himself, right? People are dying in LMDC and nobody is calling attention to what is happening at LMDC. And we are worried about the wrong things. I'm not off topic because that's part of the reason the Louisville Community Bail Fund exists. We call out the injustices that are taking place and find those solutions. This is not a solution for what is happening in our community or what is happening inside the jail right now or what the folks need who are committing criminal crimes. I'm not off topic. We're talking about why the Louisville Community Bail Fund exists. Nobody asked us why and what we do, and I gave that to you. So now you know. But I expect to be treated with respect, and that's by everybody in this room. Mr. Chairman, uh, if, if we could have just a couple seconds to close. Well, I do have one more turn. Okay. Of course. Yes, thank you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Alicia Richardson. Um, members of the committee, community, uh, committee, thank you for the. Oh yes, I'm sorry. Yes, members of the committee, committee, thank you for the opportunity to share my experience with you today. My name is Alicia Richardson. I'm a 34 year old business owner, proud mother of three. Uh, children and I lived and worked in Louisville for nearly 20 years but I'm originally from Cleveland Ohio in 2019 I had one of the worst experience I've ever had one night after a long day at work I was hanging out with some friends and having a drink then a dear friend of mine called me in a frantic state she was in a situation of domestic violence and she desperately needed my help she was in a uh, panic and asked me to please come and get her so I got in my car in hindsight I should have never gotten into the car but right there and then I didn't know what else to do uh, as I was driving I realized I wasn't feeling well so I pulled over into a gas station then by accident I ran into a gas pump the police came and I was immediately arrested um, I don't even want to talk about the experience when I was locked up I was taken to a jail and held on a bail that I could not afford I didn't want to do I didn't know what to do like many people in our community I was le living pay to paycheck to paycheck um, I had just graduated the Louisville Urban League Kentucky uh, KY bills program I didn't have an emergency savings or anything like that I was worried about my kids and my mother who had recently suffered from two aneurysms on the same day and um, they all depended on me jail is a scary place I didn't wish this experience on anyone um, I was there for two days don't get me wrong I believe in the justice process I believe in taking responsibility but you just don't put a person in jail before they get their day in court you don't say someone is presumed innocent and then set bail you know they can't pay fortunately the bail project learned about my case and they provided me with bail assistance I was grateful that I could go home to my children and help take care of my mom to this day my case is still pending that means I could still be sitting in jail almost three years later if it wasn't for the bail project I would be sitting in jail especially during COVID you know the case a lot of cases just wasn't being seen or what ha I don't know what was going on um waiting for a resolution um, since my release, um, I have started my own construction company and I am successful with that. I am in the Russell Business Tech Incubator and I'm also, I just got accepted to the UFK Business Accelerator, uh, Minority Accelerator. And, um, 
I am doing well providing for my family while attending court as required to fight my case and take responsibility. Um, because I was drinking that night, um, my judge um, also asked me to participate in a um, program in reference to, um, you know, gaining sobriety. So I'm also a, a client of Ladies of Promise, and they have been making sure, just as well as the bail project, that I make it to every court date as well. Um I've attended every court date as asked to with the help of the court reminders and transportation from the bail project. And I'm thankful for the work that they do. The justice, the justice system should not treat people differently based on how much money they have. We all have a right to a due process, a right to get our day in court, a right to be presumed innocent. And this should not depend on the size of your bank account. We need to fix the cash bail system. Until then, charities like the bail project are needed. They level the playing field for folks like me. This bill will hurt people living in po poverty as it is. Nearly half of the people in jails in Kentucky are there awaiting, uh, I mean, awaiting their court dates because they can't afford a bill. I ask you to please vote no on this bill. I also would like to say, um, I would like to give your, your family, family my condolence. Um, we lost a family member on 26th and Broadway due to somebody who served out of jail um, for a crime similar to what he did and then he ran my cousin over and it took forever for um, the police to find him um, but we did end up getting justice so I, I would like to say um, I don't necessarily think that it's people getting bailed out by the bail project and that's why they're um, repeating their offenses people have the choice to get out of jail and do something different um, like I am and if they choose not to um, that they should uh, the judge to give them more time or something, a higher bail, but I don't think the bail project should be canceled just because uh, other the people that's being released are making bad choices because there's more people that's making good choices than bad. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And we're going to give um, the sponsors the last word. I will say I do apologize for the last moment in the sense that it took some time and we are not going to allow disruptive witnesses in this arena. It's just not going to be permitted. We are here for civil discourse, and we'll do it with professionalism, or we won't do it at all. With that, sponsors, you may address the committee. I want to thank you. I, I, there's a lot of comments that were made today about the, the jail in Louisville. We've had six deaths in a couple months. That's serious issues, and we're, we, I want to work with anybody on that. Uh, Representative Black, Bratcher and I and others have contacted uh, the corrections officers there, and we're looking to see what we can do. I want to work with anybody on that. There's serious problems on there. I wanted to say that quickly. This bill is not a panacea. It does not fix all problems. There's no doubt about that. But we are charged with protecting public safety. Our people and our Constitution requires, unfortunately, requires ju judges to set money bail for anybody except for those who've, char who've been charged with a capital offense. Representative Blanton and I are working on something because we don't like that. We're working on a bill that is being drafted now. It's in the drafting stages to amend our Constitution to allow our judges to follow most other states and the federal government and not require and not posting, not setting a bail for people who are a danger to the community. There will be a hearing like there is in federal court, Mr. Chairman, as you know, and the counsel on both sides and the prosecutor have an opportunity to make the case that there should not be a bail set. This young man probably shouldn't have had a bail set. Maybe, I don't know, I wasn't in, in the, there wasn't a hearing. But the point is we shouldn't have to have bail for very dangerous people. Ms. Representative Blanton and I are looking to change that, however, the people of Kentucky in, the, in our Constitution require bail to be set. And when there's bail to be set, we cannot allow an entity to make a mockery of it. We cannot allow an entity to make a mockery of it. If we're going to have cash bail, and I don't necessarily like that, but that's the law by our Constitution, then we have to have cash bail. If a judge set $100,000 for a man who tries to assassinate someone, that is not enough. That's not appropriate for an entity to come in and bail them out. It's also, in my view, not appropriate for a rich man to bail himself out. That's why Representative Blanton and I are trying to fix that. But we can't fix that with the bill. It has to be a constitutional amendment. House Bill 313 is a step forward in making and improving the bail system. And I think it is necessary. It's highlighted by last week's incident. But even if last week's incident didn't occur, this is necessary. We filed it before then. We had hearings on it last summer. Mr. Chairman, I know that Representative Blanton wants to close, but the father wants to take 10 seconds if he could. Um, and you may better make it five, but let's okay. go.
I just wanted to say, you know, you heard their stories about these people that needed to get bailed out because they were doing first-time offenses and stuff. But what about the guy that killed my daughter? It wasn't. It was multiple, multiple over years and years. They did no background check. They did no accountability. They bailed him out, and he killed my daughter the very next day. See, you hear about single. We're not trying to eliminate them. But, you know, you're hearing about the single offenses, but what about the multiple offenses that they're getting those people out? They've proved they weren't going to change. Thank you, sir. Sorry. All right, we have a motion on the bill and a second. I am going to give a just a brief moment if any of our members have questions. Seeing none, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Representative Banta? Yes. Representative Blanton? Aye. Representative Bratcher? Yes, and I'd just like to say, Mr. and Ms. Trout, you know, I have m many families at that Greenwood and Dixie intersection. I grew up in PRP, and I just can't imagine what you're going through. And thank you for your brave testimony today. I vote uh, absolutely yes. Representative Cantrell? Yeah. Representative Decker? Yes. Representative Elliott? Yes. Representative Fisher? Yes. Representative Heverin? Yes. Representative Cole Carney? Briefly explain, Mr. Chair. I'm going to pass today. I, I fully believe the sponsors and their intent and in, in improving our public safety. I want to thank Madeline's family for coming and sharing their story with us, and I'm very, very deeply sorry for your loss. I do have significant due process concerns with this bill that I will discuss with the sponsors, and I'm glad to see and hear that you are working on a bill that I think addresses the actual issue that we need to figure out in this state, which is bail being set, how it's done, and conditions of release. So I passed today, but I hope to work with you in the future to fix that. Representative Lewis? Yes. Representative Maddox? Yes. Representative McCoy? Explain my vote, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, first of all, I want to say to the family, um, thank you all for coming. I'm, as, as a dad, I'm just, my heart goes out to you. I can't imagine. I think it's, it's literally will make me tear up thinking about it, but thank you for, for coming. To the sponsors, you guys, I know you both to be men of integrity. I know you're trying to do the right thing. We heard a lot of testimony today about the broken bail system, and it's broken. And, and unfortunately, though, guys, I don't think this bill fixes it. I think, you know, bad facts make bad law. And, and I think this is a reaction to some bad facts, but I, I'm going to be a no. But I'd love to work on it, on the issue, to see if we can't fix what is clearly a broken thing for our state. Representative Minter, briefly explain my vote. Briefly. Uh, Today it's a pass, but I want to express to Madeline's family my deepest sympathies, and I cannot imagine what you're going through. I want to thank the sponsors for bringing this bill forward and for the thoughtful discussion. I'm very happy to hear that you're working on that constitutional amendment. It is much needed. I look forward to seeing that. But I also share some concerns raised by Representatives Kulkarni and McCoy. So today I'm a pass, and I look forward to speaking with you more about it. Representative Mosher? Yes. Representative Nemes? Yes. Representative Petrie? Representative Scott? Uh, Chairman, I, I just want to say to the family, my daughter was a varsity cheerleader at Butler in 2019. We pushed the GoFundMe for your family when Madeline was murdered. So I want you to know that my heart is with you. But I also know this is not the bill, but we need work to be done to address the issues that you are bringing up. So today I want you to know I'm a pass, but I want to see the work done on this bill. Representative Stevenson. Again, I express deep sorrows. And this is a failure of the system. And I'm, I can't put people that are not a threat in the system that we have because they can't afford bail. So I'm, it's broke. It's broke. But making it work on the backs of poor people doesn't work. Let's fix the system. Chairman Massey. Yes. I am going to ask Representative Mosier if she would like to record a yes vote or a vote. Sorry. I wasn't trying to lead you. Would you like to record a vote on House Bill 488? A yes vote. All right. And Representative Elliott. 
And Representative Elliott, did you vote on, on 488? That was the DVO enhancement bill. I'll record an I vote. Okay, thank you. With that, members, please stay tuned to your text because I will send you information out about upcoming bills that will be heard. Um, and I will get those out to you as quickly as I know. I do know we'll have 402 on the agenda next week, which is fertility fraud. Thank you.